I hosted uh, Andreas B. Haida not too long ago with a big group of classrooms where he shared his most recent expedition and the work that he's doing. And uh, it's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely beautiful. The classrooms were so excited. He is the captain, owner, and mission director of the SV Barba. He's a professional sailor and marine biologist with a background as a military diver and naval officer and extensive experience working uh, with and for the ocean. And just to touch on that expedition briefly, which uh, I'm sure uh, Andres will as well, from June 1st to October 5th, the SV Barba sailed 6,000 nautical miles from Stravanger, Norway, to the pack ice uh, around the North Pole and back, stopping in London along the way. The purpose of this expedition was to explore the polar Atlantic ecosystem, assess its current health, and highlight its vulnerability to climate change and pollution. So coming to us live from the Barba right now, we've got uh, Andres. Hey, Andres, how you doing? I'm doing good, uh, Joe. Thank you. And thank you for the introduction. Um, and I'll uh, show you a presentation today with uh, some of the work we've done in the past and also uh, last summer. So start off with that, a short video, half a minute. Um, and then I shall introduce myself and the project. All so right, bear with good. me for a second. Yeah. Perfect. So you got that one, uh, Joe? Uh, yeah, it came through. Um, did you get to see the video uh, all right? Yeah, yeah, it played beautifully. Okay, perfect. So uh, yes, yeah, so there was uh, a video just uh, setting the stage and showing some of the work we've uh, done in the, in the past, uh, working with orcas in that particular case. Uh, and you did a good introduction of me. Um, Essentially, Andreas Heide from Norway, uh, expedition sailor, marine biologist, and diver. And I combine all these uh, skill sets to, to use uh, the sailing vessel Barba that I'm currently on as a science and communications uh, platform, uh, mainly in the Arctic. So, um, so I don't work as a scientist today. I support scientists because I don't have time to to work full-time as a scientist like operating the boat and having a know-how of of how to approach wildlife polar bears and whales is a full-time occupation uh, and this is a photo of the boat outside fair islands where we're going back this uh, summer and you can see we're um we've deployed a manta troll um trolling for my, uh, microplastic but that was a separate project so this boat is quite uh, small 37 feet or 12 meters which is uh, a small expedition boat, if you like. Uh, but that's also one of the reasons we've been able to do so much work in the field. It's uh, reasonably um, inexpensive to to operate in comparison with, with larger vessels. And we can still do great things out there. So I'll, I'll show you some examples now coming up next. Uh, and what we predominantly do is to work with whales, uh, both because I'm very passionate about whales, but also because they are excellent at communicating uh, ocean conservation to a uh, greater audience and what we see here is a photo of myself in northern norway a few years back approaching a pod of orcas and you can see the orca calf behind its uh, mother and uh, slip streaming uh, in particular last year we did our longest expedition to date the arctic sands expedition going from norway up to svalbard all the way up to the pack ice and then down to Jan Main, onwards to London and back to Stavanger. So that was four months and um, 10,000 kilometers or a quarter of the world's uh, circumference, if you like. So that was a, a long expedition. And in particular today, I'll talk you through the, the Svalbard part. Uh, and the Svalbard is a Norwegian island uh, far up north, touching the uh, ice edge of the pack ice around the uh, North Pole. 
And we talk a lot about the animals but the uh, and the boats, but the most important thing to the work we do that enables us to work in the field is, is the team. Uh, and I can't overemphasize the importance of having a good team, good people, good friends to, to do the work out there. And this is the team that circumnavigated the Svalbard. Uh, to the left, we have um, Mark Romanoff, cinematographer from California. Uh, next, we have myself wearing a red cap in honor of uh, Jack Cousteau, one of my superheroes. We have Julia Ercoletti, whale scientist from uh, Rome. And then we have Tord Carlson. He's a photographer and sailor from uh, Norway. He's also a teacher. And next, we have uh, Arsikan Askin from Turkey, uh, who is a science communicator. And then finally, we have uh, Ilva, who is a sailor and, and also a nurse from uh, Sweden. So it's a good and, and diverse team. Uh, one of the things in terms of science, there are limitations to what you can do from a small boat in the field. Uh, but one of the things we are able to do is to use a PAM guard system, uh, which is an underwater listening uh, device. So with this device, uh, we can can uh, do sound recordings from the field, uh, which helps us tell which species are, are in the waters. Uh, and also it gives an indication of abundance of uh, whale species. And it's quite a complex uh, system to operate on, on a small boat, but we were able to, to do so successfully. Um, and here you can see a spectrogram which, which, uh, which visualizes the sound recordings uh, we're doing. Uh, and next, I'm going to play to you an, uh, uh, a sound recording of a pod of orcas that's feeding on, on herring. And I remember before starting to, to use hydrophones, looking at the ocean, I always thought it was like a quiet place. Uh, you would hear uh, engine boats and so on. But since I started working with uh, whales, I realized that there is a whole lot more to it. So this is a, a spectrogram which shows us uh, the frequency. Um, and thus visualizes uh, the sounds we're hearing. So again, this is a pod of orcas hunting herring. And here you go. Perfect. So we, we got that one, uh, Joe. Perfect. Yep. So are you there, Joe? Yep. Yep. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear okay. Sorry about that. But you got the sound recording this time. Yep. Excellent. So this was a uh, pot of orcas hunting herring in, in the waters of uh, Norway. And... And I think just bringing this awareness to people that orcas, it's not only a cool looking dolphin or, or whale, if you like, it's also a highly intelligent animal that's in the in the ocean. It's able to communicate with up to 50 individuals at, at one time. And I think that helps bring awareness to the ocean. And I think these animals have the same rights as we do. So moving on to, to another fascinating creature we've uh, met multiple times. Um, sailing in, in in the arctic including this summer is a, a sperm whale encounter um and this is half minute And uh, yeah, again, growing up in Norway, I didn't even know that we had these animals in, in Norwegian waters, but but we certainly do. And these migrate all the down, all the way down to the equator. And again, bringing awareness to people that we have these animals um, around uh, helps increase their protective status. Uh, and in terms of sound recordings, these sperm whales, we can hear them out to up to 10 kilometers away which is uh, very fascinating. And, and to my knowledge, it's the largest, uh, it's the loudest animal in the animal kingdom. And they can dive to 3000 meters and hold their breath for two hours. So it's one of my favorite uh, whales. 
Moving on, this is uh, Svalbard, um, where we encounter drifting sea ice. And on this uh, ice flow, you can see a, um, a, a couple of uh, walrus. Uh, and uh, the walrus was more or less extinct in, in Svalbard just a few decades back because of their ivory tusks. And also the Vikings would hunt them for their uh, skin to make uh, ropes for their Viking ships. But now we're seeing this uh, walrus coming back in, in great numbers. And I think it's important to highlight these successful conservation st stories as well in a time when we are seeing challenges at multiple levels. Uh, this is a map, a map of the sea ice at the time. And you can see that the dense red, uh, well, the red field is dense sea ice where we're unable to sail. But we sailed up to the orange fields of uh, sea ice looking for um, bowhead whales and uh, polar bears. And what we did find was a plastic barrel. So, so even up in this pristine Arctic, there is plastic pollution, uh, which was somewhat sad, but we made the best of it. We recovered the barrel and we have brought it back to uh, mainland Norway, where it's al already visited uh, one school as a part of an uh, educational program we're running. And I think it's very important to Again, educate especially children because they bring knowledge with them home to their parents. And I think, um, yeah, that's one of the things I'm a strong believer in is education. Another uh, encounter we had was so we were going to a bird colony to collect a bird camera where we encountered a polar bear mom and, and a cub. And it's a beautiful sight, but it's also a bit sad seeing these animals knowing that they should have been out on the pack ice hunting seals. Um, but hopefully these, these ones, they made it through the summer. So the summer is a difficult time for them because they rely on, on pack ice to hunt. So it's quite concerning seeing with, with global warming, retreating sea ice uh, and knowing how many species uh, depend on the sea ice to survive, including polar bears. Uh, another another encounter we had uh, in a couple of hours we met with ten blue whales and if you can imagine the boat of the uh, the sailing boat is thirty seven feet or twelve meters and these two blue whales they're um, well above twenty meters in, in length and again uh, the blue whales were almost hunted to extinction in in the North Atlantic and and in the, in the southern hemisphere but they're now showing slow and, and hopeful signs of of recovery so going out there meeting with these whales and uh, and telling the story that they they are coming back and, and that we can can turn things around that's important to us and this is as part of the scientific work we do we also do id photos and like whale sharks as we've seen earlier today and, and most other animals you can individually identify the um the whale with a photo so if we go back in 10 years and take a, a new photo, we could see the same whale or we could encounter the same whale in Iceland this summer. Uh, furthermore, we used drones to fly above the whale uh, with a uh, LIDAR or laser instrument, which allows us to do an assessment of length and body uh, conditioning. And this is work done by our scientific partner, uh, WhaleWise. It's a very dedicated the research team in, in the UK. So I think uh, that's uh, as, as much time as I, I, I have today to, to talk you through some of the work we do from uh, the sailing vessel Barba. Um, you can follow us on Barba Boat at Instagram, or you can go to our webpage, barba.no. And then our next expedition is this summer uh, sailing to Fair Islands and Iceland, where, where we will be looking for the enigmatic uh, bottlenose whales. So that's uh, rather exciting. So. Um, Please, Joe, if you have any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andres, thanks so much. I, I, I love that image of uh, the barba next to the blue whales. It really gives you yeah, that uh, size of the blue whales and the size of the barba. Yeah, and we have some uh, excellent video recordings of that as well, but that's reserved for a documentary we're working on. So yeah. we have a, a one hour documentary coming out uh, next year with covering the blue whale encounter as, as one of many animal encounters we had. Why don't we take a minute, if you're able to move around, and just take a look at the barba? 
Absolutely, it's quite quick because it's a small boat, so we could start there. This is the uh, navigation station where we have all sorts of instruments. Uh, and then here's the bow. So when we're on long expeditions, half of it will just be stuffed with uh, gear. So one person sleeps in the bow, uh, the saloon. And here we have the galley where we have a fridge, a gas stove, um, and all the things you need, basically. Here's the uh, shower and the, and the heads, the toilet. It's quite small, which is uh, very good when you're at sea and being thrown around, because we do get thrown around a bit. And then in the back, we have two double cabins. So as you can imagine, when we're like six people and we have gear and food for three weeks, it uh, gets quite stuffed. And then moving out outside, you can see uh, see the boat. I just anchored outside Stavanger, and here we have easy access uh, to the water, so we can get easily get off the boat and also back on the boat once we jump in the in the water. And it's quite a big part of our job is to work with film crews to to document whales. And then hopefully they find the material finds its way to uh, nature documentaries, which we've been featured in a couple already. So now I can't hear you. Uh, there we go. Uh, amazing. Perfect. It really kind of kind of puts into context uh, what it must have been like taking the barba right up to the pack ice and right up into the pack ice. What I imagine, what were the logistics of that? What were you thinking about? What were you watching while doing that? Yeah, the, the main thing, like I've done it so many times now, so it's experience, uh, which allows you to, to make the right decisions. That's the, the main thing really. And then making sure everything on the boat works, you rely on a lot of technical gear, satellite phones, the engine, diving gear, and camera gear and, and whatnot, um, getting weather forecasts with the satellite phone. So communication is a challenge. But then also just being able to, to read nature, uh, understand understand the currents, the ice, and, and how the wind will funnel through certain areas and how, how just everything works and, and making assessments in the field. And that's part of the excitement with the job is kind of pushing the limits a bit, but still staying on the on the safe side. Yeah, well, well, people have to visit the website. Uh, there's some amazing pictures, especially photos of the Barba in that landscape, that huge landscape of the ice. I like the picture that you have behind you. I think those those images are are, are so powerful. Yeah, indeed they are. And it's it's a bit surreal to see these things myself sometimes and, and you know, realize that I've, I've been there together with, with my team. So when we're there, it's it's hard work and... and you don't realize it, but once you're back, it's you're wondering if it's actually happened. And uh, so goes with swimming with whales as well. When you see these big whales underwater, it's quite something. Yeah. And those moments must be pretty spontaneous when, uh, you know, you find the whales and uh, I'm sure there's a few things you have to think about before you slip into the water. Yeah, we uh, so we've done this for many years now. So we observe the whales over time to kind of try to assess the behavior before we, we get in. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and also safety is a big thing. Not that the whale itself is dangerous, but if you get lost from the boat up in, up in the Arctic, that's uh, in the middle of the open ocean. That's something you wish to avoid. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That would be a big deal. Not, uh, not a great thing. So you mentioned uh, a documentary on the way. Do you have uh, maybe an estimate of when, when it might yeah next world. next yeah next year if if we're successful with getting the additional funding it will come out uh, next year and it's it's got the potential to to be big massively so especially since we had uh, mark romanoff from california uh, documenting it and he's mm -hmm. um he, re he already works with bbc and nat geo and discovery channel because yeah. it doesn't help if if we're out there and we're able to capture it all uh, with a camera. So of course. again, it's it's the team effort. I can't overemphasize the importance of, of having a good team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can't do everything on your own. Um, 
the if if the the little clip that you shared at the beginning is any indication, it's going to be just a beautiful uh, a beautiful feature. Now, yeah. uh, a, a big part of what you were doing was uh, looking at the whales, and so I'm yeah. wondering. Uh, we saw some of the the hydrophones, some of the some of the the recordings that you played of the orcas. What other kind of information are you taking when you see the blue whales? When you see the orcas? Well, whenever you see whales, so first of all, our scientific whale work is coordinated by WhaleWise, which is the whale research team. And we are their uh, ears and eyes out in the field. So whenever mm -hmm. we encounter whales, we take note of the uh, time and the location. Uh, number of uh, whales with species. Sometimes you have multiple species in, in one area, fin whales, humpback whales, dolphins. Uh, so you, you write down as, as much as you can, basically. Um, that's the first thing we do. Then we try to do ID photos, um, sound recordings. In some cases, we fly the drone to get a, um, as, as you saw in the presentation, to using this software to assess the uh, length and body conditioning of the whale. Um, and then as part of the communication work, we try to, to film them as well, starting topside with, with the drone, uh, also using 360 cameras. We have a, a, a 360 educational program that we're uh, working on. Uh, mm -hmm. together with a few universities. Uh, and then when all that is done, uh, that's when we see if there's an opportunity to get in the water and, and try to get some observations from, from underwater, uh, both for scientific purposes, but also for storytelling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the plastics, just touching on the, uh, the plastics. Yeah. We saw that example where you found the big barrel. Uh, and we saw an example early in the presentation where you had that manta trawl uh, in the water. Yep. Were you looking for microplastics as well that far north? Uh, yes. So the uh, the manta trawl that was from 2019, a, a separate project. Um, but but what what we do know is that no matter where on the planet that you use this uh, trawl, you will find microplastic. Yeah. So even up there in the pristine north, where you have you know no signs of, of humans at all you can't even see an airplane and you can be there for days without seeing anybody you know that if you take a glass of water from the sea it will contain microplastic and that's you know i don't i don't know what to say about it really it's a gigantic experiment of, of which we don't know the uh, outcome um yeah. but it's obvious that it's not beneficial for the oceans and i think Again, the best thing we can do is to to tell the stories of these animals here and, and show examples of uh, how plastic ends up in nature. Um, I could have included a photo of, we found a, a dead rain there that had gotten its antlers entangled in the plastic and then it got eaten by a polar bear. So, so just finding these individual stories and, and bringing awareness, I think, yeah, that's the best we can do. Um, also, every now and then we do cleanups. Um, and there is limits to how much plastic we can bring on this boat. Yep. But I think just personally going on a beach, uh, picking up plastic, you feel like you're doing something with, with the problem. And then you bring, bring a bunch of friends. And at the end of the day, maybe you've collected you know, a bunch of uh, big garbage bags of, of ocean plastic. And so you've removed that from, from the ocean. You've had a good day out. And, um, and also you've made your friends aware of, of the problem. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got one more question here that I'm going to squeeze in from online. Uh, yeah. And this question is about uh, a bit about the barba in general. So uh, what do you do on the days when you have no wind to sail? And then how does the barba handle storms in the Arctic? Uh, yeah. So the um, so when there's no wind, we typically use the use the engine. So we have an engine on board. Uh, so if we have no wind going against the wind or in a tight spot, we use the engine. Uh, and then stormy weather, we try to avoid that at all cost because there's not. We want to avoid risk when we can. Uh, so so far, we've avoided the worst storms, but we have been in situations when it's really rough. Um, so then you reduce the sails to a minimum and, and just try to sail out of the uh, weather system. And also we have additional systems. If we get caught in a perfect storm, we have like a, a series of small drogues that we can deploy from the stern of the boat, but I haven't had to test that yet in uh, extreme conditions. So typically like the best best strategy is to avoid it by uh, staying ahead with the weather forecast and, uh, and being on the alert. Yeah. 
All right, we'll share these links one more time here. Uh, if you want to follow along, here's the website, uh, barbara.no. And then we also have uh, the Instagram. So Instagram is probably the best spot to follow along for this summer, for July. Yeah, I think so. I'd say both, but uh, we'll, we'll yeah. primarily Instagram and then we'll link to the webpage for more in-depth uh, material. All right, excellent. Well, Andres, thank you so much for joining us on uh, World Biodiversity Day. Thanks for taking us into that Arctic world a little bit uh, on board the Barba. Uh, and we look forward to following along on the expedition uh, to the Faroe Islands in July. Thank you, Joe. And, and keep up the uh, great work you're doing as well. It's, uh, it's a team effort. All right. Thank you so much. Looking forward to hosting you with Classrooms again. And uh, we'll talk soon. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. See ya. Thank you.